verse 1, Romans 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Let's pray again. Father, I ask you in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus that you would take this word and inscribe it on every heart, your word, what you say. And I pray, Father, by your Spirit, that you would lead us into all truth. And Lord, that you would give us the unction, the ability, and the will to be able to carry out thine own divine word and will of our life in our lives. Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We walk in units of life and when we're saved, we have the, if I can call it, the potential of it. The old man in verse 6, our old man is crucified when you got saved. You yielded yourself to Christ. You died. I hope, I pray, I trust that I know most of us, but you're baptized in water. Not talking about sprinkling, talking about full submersion, baptized in water. And this is one of the the, the very uh, passages of, of Scripture for to teach on baptism. But if we can look at it, and as we have been looking at it, that the newness of life is not just being baptized. For if you're not saved and you go into a baptismal tank, all you've done is had a bath. Newness of life starts from conversion. The baptism is that you are publicly showing people or proclaiming that you are Christ's and going on with him. The waters symbolize the tomb, the grave. They close over and bringing up out of it is newness of life. And because of that, even in the spiritual context, we look at how when we're saved, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's what the Bible says. And it seems as though, well, we can live how we like according to men, even believers. Do what we like, live how we like, sin when we like, and we're all under grace. And listen, I believe in sovereign grace. I'm kept, I'm kept by the power of God because of his sovereign grace. I believe in it. Even in my failures, I believe in sovereign grace. But the old man, the old Ken, and you can say the old woman, the old person that you were, he died when he got saved. I died that Christ would live. Paul in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Think about this. I am crucified, he said, with Christ. This one-time uh, scholar of, of the Hebrew Scriptures, this one-time Judaizer, this one-time man who sat under Gamaliel, one of the head scholars of his day, he says, I'm crucified to everything, every single thing that it tells me, and I am crucified as a man. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, in this body. Notice, in the flesh, in this body. 
Paul's not speaking about some other hitherland somewhere else or hinterland somewhere. He's not speaking about glory in the sky. He's speaking about his day, his life, where he was in his body at that time. He says, the life that I now live in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Listen, who loved me and gave himself for, he gave up himself for me. I think the start of walking in newness of life must be that, one, we died when we get saved, but we must realize throughout our days as a believer walking this life that Christ loves us. Do you know that he loves you? There's people who backslide and fall away and people think, well, you know, I can't cope and I can't keep up or I can't do this, that, or the other, so I can't keep this Christian thing. And you're right, you can't. But you're not asked to. It's Christ who keeps you. And to know that he loves you, that he gave his life for you, and later, God willing, we're going to look at how he is our life. He becomes our life. So we walk in newness of life. Newness of life isn't just about to stop doing the things we used to do, and we will. We have looked at that, and we will for a moment, but it's more than that. It's, it's about a life of worship. It's a life of surrender. You see, folks, people don't like to think that they're having to surrender. You see, if you died that Christ might live, then you've already surrendered. But parts of our life, the old man raises, the old woman raises their head, and they must be surrendered again afresh anew to Christ. To what the Spirit and the Word tell us. You know, many, many of us say, I'm going to seek God's Word on this. And that's what we should do, by the way. And we seek God's word on certain situations and we read and we pray and we read and we pray. Sometimes it seems to take forever that he's not answering our prayers or that he's not speaking to us. But maybe he is and we just don't like what he's saying. Do you ever think of that? Maybe he is speaking and we just don't like what God is telling us. Well, that's not God. I'll go and ask the pastor. Don't worry about what the pastor says if God said it. Well, maybe he'll tell me something different and I'm reading it wrong and you ask the pastor and the pastor tells you according to God's word then do that and everything in you fights against it and everything in you does not like it and everything in you says, I don't believe that, I'm not going to listen to that, but you know it was God. (laughs) doesn't matter what the pastor says, it's what he says. doesn't matter what about... Anyone says it's what he says. What has God said to you about your situation? And you don't like it. So it doesn't matter what I say, really. It's what the Lord says. It's what God's word tells us. And applying it is us dying again to self because we don't like it. We don't want it. We want to run from it. And applying that to our lives, living that out in our lives is walking in newness of life. It's called repentance. And a new, not a new, but another teaching I can call it is from a, 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 if I can call hyper grace teaching, if I want for another word, is this that, that, you know, well, you know, I can really do as I like I'm not saying they all believe us, but I can do as I like, live how I want, and, and that covers it all. The Bible says if you're dead to sin, how can you live in it any longer? You're alive unto righteousness. And the man and the woman who say that they love the Lord Jesus Christ, that they have been blood washed and blood bought and born again of the Spirit, the man and the woman who think that they can live habitually, continually in an open course of sin and say, I love him, or realize don't that their love of their old man is greater. Their old woman is greater. That goes for all of us. Paul tells us 
that we should walk in newness of life. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit, he lives in you. Isn't that right? And so the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, here as we read in Romans 6, who raised Jesus from the dead, he will, one, raise you spiritually to behold Christ. Two, he raises you from the dead, that is, from the grave at the resurrection. And so if he lives in us, he also raises us to behold his word that we might die, that Christ might increase. What do you think John meant when he said, he must increase, and I must decrease? What do you think John meant? And this is a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Christ must increase. Ken must decrease. I'm not asking you to say it out loud, but say it in your own heart. The Lord Jesus Christ must increase. I, put your name in, I must decrease. So notice here, Paul says we should walk in newness of life. And the newness of life isn't cleaning up your act, by the way. In fact, that is a product of what happens after conversion. Newness of life isn't you cleaning up your act. It isn't you making a goodwill gestures and all this sort of stuff. Newness of life is a place and a position you've been birthed into and planted into by the Holy Spirit. If you have not been saved, then you can't walk in newness of life. One, because you won't understand the Word of God. You can't answer to the Word of God in the sense from your heart to respond to it if you haven't been saved. But if you are saved and you're born again, then the Spirit in you will answer to the Word of God. So the newness of life is something you've been placed into, not something you're trying to do. So when people say who are saved, that is, when Christians say, you know what, I've been trying to quit the cigarettes, but I can't. I don't believe that. You know why? Because if the Holy Spirit is in you, he's the one who enables you. It's like the man or the woman saying, I can't stop doing this out of the other. You may fail going over and over, but the Holy Spirit will tell you it's wrong, so you need to crucify the old man or woman. It's like someone saying, you know, I, I can't give up the alcohol because I like it too much. Well, if you like it too much, you don't love the Lord enough. And this teaching today in churches, hated by Christians. It's hated by Christians. Do you know why? Because they want to live how they like. So when I got saved, as we mentioned last week, when the Lord saved me, you can uh, re rehearse and recall where the Lord saved you, found you, called you from, brought you out of. You'll, you can say, well, the Lord brought me and this is how I've changed. So the question has been, has there been a change since you've been saved? It isn't, are you perfect? That is what it's being said here. It's not what's being asked. It, has there been a change? Is there an ongoing, ongoing process? Maybe things you struggle with, but the Spirit will give you the ability to overcome. We've looked at the word newness, which gives the idea of something made fresh or something unprecedented. And we looked at the new covenant. It's the same word as newness or new life. It's the word Kinas from Kinatas, or Kinatas is from Kinas. And it means unprecedented. The cross of Christ was unprecedented. The blood of Jesus that paid for all our sins was unprecedented. It had never happened before in all of man's history. From the universe was even 
formed. It had never happened before throughout all the religions. It had never happened before where God became flesh and died for sinful man rather than the idea of being sinful man trying to reach God. It was unprecedented that Christ would come and shed his blood and somebody like me, and like you, would be forgiven of our sins and saved and kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So, will you turn with me to Ephesians 4, please? Ephesians 4. I'm hoping to finish this today. Um, I may need one more week. I don't want to labor you with big long series but I think this is important for the church today I think it's important that the church realizes I still believe and it's not perfection listen I don't believe in sinless perfection until Christ comes I don't believe in the doctrine of sinlessness that is that we can perfect ourselves completely I believe in positionally we're sinless in Christ but to ourselves, I do not believe in sinless perfection where every one of us can come to the place of perfection. It sounds a bit too Mormonism for me. A bit too Mormonism where they believe they can perfect themselves to become another God. So I don't believe that we're sinless in the sense where our lives are in these earthly bodies. I don't believe in the sinless doctrine, but I believe we could sin less. <laughs> Does that make sense? Not that we can be sinless, but we could sin less. I believe in the holiness doctrine. And yet I feel. Try not to. But in my imperfections, I feel. Look, I'm just being an honest minister before you this morning. I'm being an honest pastor. I'm rubbish. I try and live right. But I'm still a sinner saved by grace. I am elevated, as it were, in Christ to a son. But I'm still in this body a sinner saved by the grace of God. Ephesians 4. And later I run down. Ephesians chapter 4. And later I run down to verse... Let's see, 23 just for time's sake. Let's go 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Conversation means your lifestyle, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts or with the dominance of the deceitful lusts. The idea of courting is kata, gives the idea of pressing down something that dominates. That's what according there means. So the deceitful lusts of the old man and the old woman, they were dominant in our lives. The pressing down, it was like we were covered and captured by the domineering deceitful lusts. Notice this, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed. Will you say renewed? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The, the idea here uh, for renewed, you know what the word, one of the words used for it? It's, it's the word young. Strange, isn't it? Y-O-U-N-G. The young, of your, young, the young of your spirit mind. Let me explain it to you for a moment. It gives the idea to think or be spiritually transformed to take on a new mind, but it does not mean of the actual mind itself, as in forget everything you've ever come through. It's not what it means. <laughs> forget every trouble you've ever had. That's not what it means. Forget the, the hurts of the past. That's not what this means. Because the past that we have come from, God can always work it for the good that you and I will learn from it. <laughs> 
that you and I will learn uh, the, the, the things of the people we've come across and the, the things that's happened and the way God has been through it with us, the, the, the hurts and the heartaches and the troubles and the worries and the anxieties and how God has blessed it through us. Do you think God wants you to forget that when he has given you so much to infuse into your mind and into your heart? Not in the slightest. That's not what God means here at all. It's not what Paul is saying. So it doesn't mean your actual mind who you are, your memory. Notice here it is the spirit of your mind. That's different. And the renewed spirit means the young spirit. It gives the idea of this. That which plagues your mind, your thinking, that which calls you and draws you into that which is not of Christ. In other words, that which is in your mind right now that someone has annoyed you or something has beset you or there's something being told to you or this or that or the other and you're starting to get hurt by it or maybe you're becoming angry at it or maybe even bitter from it. Listen, see bitterness, brothers and sisters. Let me just put it like this. See when a Christian or anyone gets bitter, do you know what it's like? It's like you drinking poison and expecting the other, poison and the other, expecting the other person to die. It's like you drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Guess who's dying? You. And all of these things in our minds, listen, we all get attacked from it. We all do. The recent thing that happened maybe in your family or in your home or whatever it may be, and maybe it's a stress, a worry, an anxiety, no matter what it is, maybe it's a doubt that's come against the word of God, or God has spoken to you and you've run away and you've said, oh, God will never forgive me now. All of those things that are in your mind, this very moment or plagued you this last while, that is the spirit of your mind. It's the young mind, not the memorable mind. Does that make sense now? So where you are, you go into the room, your closet, your secret place, you open the word of God, and you start to renew your mind. You come home from work, and the boys in work, the women in work, have been swearing like French parrots all day. And you're in the middle of that, and there's nothing you can do about it, and they've been blaspheming the name of the Lord, and they've been maybe even challenging you or saying something against you. It may be somewhere else, but when you come home and your mind is polluted with it, that's your spirit of your mind is thinking on at that moment. You're polluted with it. And it drags you down, and it's making you feel uneasy. Here's what it means. Be renewed about that thought. Here's another one for you. See when the doctor says this is an impossible illness? Or when the doctor says, I'm sorry, like, you know, you're just going to have to live with this illness because this illness is uh, incurable. You may not die from it, but, you know, you'll be um, maybe deteriorating with it. And you go home and you, you have to live with that. See, that's close to you, isn't it? You know what that's like. That's close to you. Now, we know we're not afraid of reality. But what we do is we renew the spirit of our mind as soon as that doubt and that thought, that negativity comes, and we get into the Word of God. And we say, Lord, this is what they say. Tell me what you're saying. Tell me what you say, Lord. I'm fearful tonight, Lord, or I'm lying on my bed confident. What is it your word says? Renewing your young mind. That is, no matter how old you are, no matter if you're 101, I don't think there's anybody in here 101. It's not the age, but it's the mind that is coming to you at that time. Renew it. So let me just read it. This is what it reads like. Yield your thoughts to the indwelling, controlling, and energizing power of the Holy Spirit. To every 
to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ and to have fellowship with him in the spirit of your mind. Look, I have memories. Some good, some not so good, some bad, some horrific, (laughs) some great. And we all do. We all do. Paul isn't saying that I raise all that, but we can learn from that. But that which is now in your mind, renew it. When temptation comes, and whether that be a sexual temptation, whether that be a spiritual temptation, whether that be a temptation unto the old life, the old things, Paul says, renew it, and instead of thinking over it and 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 over it again and again and again and again and again and again and again, who's been there? He eats you up. He says, listen, renew that thought, that young mind of spirit of your mind and fellowship with Christ. Because when I read about Christ fellowshipping with the disciples, you know what I read? I read about him giving instruction, but I read about him blessing. (laughs) I read about him teaching on the eternal matters of the soul and the things concerning the kingdom of God. I read about him praying to his father and the communication uh, that he has and the communion with God that he has. I read about all of that. And when I see the disciples around him, I see their eyes fixed on him. And when he wasn't going to be there, they're afraid. You know why? They're so used to him in the midst. They're so used to him being there. And whenever he says, I will go to the Father, and, and, and he's telling them about, uh, and he prays for them in John 17, and John 16, get into John 17, and I'll ascend to my Father. When he says that, the disciples are saying, Lord, well, where are you going to go to? Well, what, what are we going to do? He says, I'll send my spirit. <laughs> you know what that tells us? We go back to square one here. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, who he is now quickened in body, made alive again to never die. That same Spirit lives in you. He lives in you, brother. He lives in you, sister. And so what do we do? Go to the Word. What do we do? We say, Lord, I will renew the spirit of my mind when all of these things beset us and come against us. He says in verse 24, I'm going to close with this. I am going to maybe do one more week. I'll see how the Lord leads me for next week, but I had so much more to show you. Notice what he says in verse 24. That you put on the new man. Would you say new man? man. (coughs) Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, I'm not speaking, I can't speak for every church because it wouldn't be fair of me, but in all honesty, I'm sure there's many, but in all honesty, how many places do you hear about putting off the old man, putting on the new man, the old man and woman? How many places do you read about living in righteousness which was created in God and given to you and living that life? How many places do you hear them, them preaching on it? How many CDs from our pastor preached on holiness today or whether it's on the Facebook page or, or whether it's on social media one way or sense, shape, form or another or whether it's on a website or whether it's a church you've visited. How many are saying you must live righteousness after what God has done? There's not too many. But I could tell you about the churches that are saying Let me tell you how to have a blessed day. I can take you to churches that are saying, we no longer preach the blood. We no longer preach the cross because it's 
It's just not correct, politically correct to do that. Well, I could take you to places that where pastors have sat with them and talked to them about these things where they're afraid to preach salvation by grace through faith. They're afraid where churches have elders who are unsaved and tell them, minister, you have 15 minutes. Or else the elders are dead in spirit and want 15 minutes only. Either I've been in both. I've preached in places where they've came and said to me, Now listen, pastor, when you come here to preach, you have 15 minutes. And I stood in the church and says, right, bye bye. And they says, what's wrong? I says, get somebody else. They don't want the word of God anymore. They don't want holiness teaching anymore. They don't want to live a life anymore. But rather, there's, there's those who are unsaved but they're influential, you see? They're influential in the church in the sense where it is what they've always done. Their family has maybe uh, been a family who has been maybe loaded with a few pounds, you know? They're very influential. And, and then there's the clicky part of church. And the clicky part of church is it's us four no more. We're the chosen frozen. And, and we're, we're not moving on this issue. <laughs> Or was it the frozen chosen? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? And there, there, there's more concern about whether we'll move the keyboard from there to here rather than the concern of how hearts are before Christ. And whether the Spirit of God is in the church, whether the Spirit of God is moving and speaking, whether the Word of God is preached, they're more concerned at the sound of the organ keyboard. I'm not saying against you, Wendy, you play it brilliant, by the way. <laughs> more concerned, I'm giving you the idea, I've come across them. Church, what is it? What has the church become? Church has become the church of the I myself, I am. There's only one I am in CET. And his name's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Only one I am. He says in verse 24 that you put on the new man which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Then for verse 25 down, he gives ideas of what an old man and old woman is like. In verse 27, after saying, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down your wrath, he says, neither give place to the devil. In what part of our lives I'm going to stop here, but in what part of our lives? Listen, see whenever I'm bringing this to you, I've been reading these scriptures over and over and over and over and over again. I've been reading them, I don't know, many times in the last few weeks, and then going on the others and reading them over. This morning I was up, I got my shower and get ready, cup of tea in my hand, and away into my study again, starting to jot down and write. And I had to go back and read them over and over and over again. Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. I wonder if I just left that there, would that be enough? Don't give the devil a foothold in your mind. Not one foothold. For you give him a foothold, he'll come to visit and then to stay. Don't give him even a foothold in your family. There's things that happen with our family and our children we just have no control over. We can't do it in the sense that it's either that or you, you chain them up and lock them in a room. But the sense is, as you are the priest of your home brother and sister, the leader the matriarch of the family. Give no place to the devil in your thought life, in your family life, among your kids, your grandkids, and so on. 
Don't let them hear you talk wrong. If you keep, if you and I talk wrong before our children, that's what they'll think is a Christian life. Is that godliness? Hmm. Neither give place to the devil in your mind. Neither give place to the devil in your heart. But rather, renew the spirit of your mind. Listen. I'm speaking about, I'm going to close with this definitely, I'm speaking about the old man, the old woman, the old life, and who we used to be. And I'm here last week, and we're great spirit in the meeting, the Lord's moving, blessing. I'm driving home. Sorry, Willie, but this is true. I'm driving home. There's this wee man on his bike. <laughs> now, that's okay, I've nothing against cyclists. But he's on his bike and he's round it. And the first wee bit of jot on a, a, a straight road I get, I, and I'm out round him. And I did. Now, it was a good bit down the road. I wasn't near knocking him off his bike. I was a good way clear. I was on the other side of the road even driving. And there's a bend down there. And this guy comes flying round the bend towards me. And I had a bit of a straight. So I just pulled in that little bit quicker. Still plenty of room. I look at my mirror to see. Make sure everything's all right. And the hand gesture I got was something shocking. You know what I did for a split second? I put my brake on to get out of the car. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Give me that. I didn't know, by the way. <laughs> brake on in the car. And I see my old man, I would have got out of the car. I wouldn't have let that go. And I just automatically, what? <laughs> <laughs> And I went to pull a handbrake on to see the guy coming in the distance. Good bit away from him, even. The hand gestures I got was shocking. I wasn't even mimicking. What about your old man, Ken? That's your old man. Put him the first. No, I went. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. So we're all tested on these things. I hope and I pray that I'm not tested again today. <laughs> I hope and pray. Because I also remember that old man that I thought was the other day of the car was about 20-something years ago. And that old man ain't just what he used to be. <laughs> but nevertheless, we must keep the old man crucified the old woman and let no corrupt communication that is cursing swearing whatever it is come out of your mouth evil talking read read that in, a, in, a, in, a, in the book of Ephesians from our chapter read it and you'll see in Ephesians 4 about even he talks about backbiting and malice and spite and all he says leave it all it's old And walk in the newness of life. May God bless his word to all of our hearts this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Take